<laughs> okay, so uh, this is this is new for me because uh, uh, we usually well, what I usually do is I organize uh, um, departmental talks. So mm. we invite people and I introduce them briefly and then they give their uh, story, and uh, that's usually very uh, uh, lively when we can be all together. Mm. And uh, with COVID and whatnot, uh, uh, we moved on to this online platform where people uh, can engage a lot more, uh, yeah. you know, participants. In fact, because uh, we can share this with uh, colleagues that are not necessarily in in, in York, uh, and we can have some speakers who are from far away. Um, and so, what I what we're trying we're trying to do today really is. Mm. Uh, uh, we are having someone who is from far away, so the <laughs> yes. more the more obvious thing would be, you know, to maybe have some sort of online uh, connection. But uh, I mean, for you, in in a in a sense, it's it's coming back to mm. uh, where you spent uh, a, a good few years yes. of, of your life, uh, and we've known each other for for for, for since mm. for more than 50, twenty-two years. Twenty-two years, uh, indeed. Yeah. So uh, it it is, I think. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, I, I uh, sometimes find it challenging to talk into the void uh, of the camera. Yes. So uh, to have someone in front of me is, is fantastic and I've used the mm. excuse of this being the summer holidays uh, mm. to not have uh, a, a, a seminar that may have not been uh, as well attended sure. uh, and instead to have a, a conversation where I'd be asking all the questions which <laughs> is uh, uh, you know, uh, an old dream of mine. <laughs> okay, so uh, so welcome back to to York, to the University mm, of you. York, to the Computer Science Department, uh, and uh, uh, maybe if you want to uh, say a few words about how you uh, you ended up uh, uh, coming to York. So I mean, uh, for those who don't know, Lyndon, uh, this is. Uh, uh, Lyndon Drake, uh, uh, who uh, spent uh, three years of, uh, uh, on, on your PhD. Uh, well, three years and then a bit extra, another year finishing it up. Uh, yes, but, but as, three as, years here. As, 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 as we probably all did. Yeah. <laughs> well, mine took almost seven years, but that was part time. So uh, mm. you know, I can only admire those people who have been uh, as, as quick as you. So uh, do you want to tell me uh, a little bit about your uh, early education, mm. you know, before you came to York, your undergraduate degrees and how you ended up uh, with this uh, focus uh, on computer science? Mm. Well, you mentioned that I'm from far away and so it's yes. actually it's lovely to be back here. <laughs> um, but I grew up in Auckland in New Zealand okay. and um, in, a, in a very... Um, a not very nice suburb called Panmure in Auckland, right. um, where I've, I've never had any ambition to go back to. <laughs> and so um, the, the pathway from there, I, you know, I had a fairly normal school setting, right. not atypical for computer science people. I didn't entirely enjoy school because I'm um, being rather nerdy and geeky. Mm. It wasn't an entirely wonderful experience. But going to university, um, I went to university in Auckland, was just awesome because all of a sudden, there were people who were interested in mathematics, physics, you know, all the, those quantitative science subjects that I loved. Um, and really my passion though had always been in programming, um, partly because of my father who insisted that for every hour of computer games, I had to do one hour of programming. I don't know where he got this, <laughs> this rule from, um, but it had a, somehow I had a, instead of putting me off programming, I found that I had um, an interest in it. Right. So I did, um, uh, they, they have this weird thing in New Zealand called conjoint degrees. So okay. I did a commerce degree, which my parents wanted me to do, and the science degree, which they also were happy for me to do, but right. where my, my, my heart lay. And, um, and so I did that and worked a um, fairly standard sort of science degree, majoring in computer science. And then another, actually similar to the Scottish system, you can do a final honours year. And so the honours year was computer science only um, and and just absolutely loved that. Right. Um, so I did, I mean, we did a robotics paper and, you know, we, classic thing, you know, we stayed up all night programming these stupid robots uh, that didn't do very did. much. Okay. And I was, um, 
Robo Cup, you know the, the yeah, soccer yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we used to have a team here in the early 2000s. Oh, there we go. So, so. this is um, 1999. Okay. Um, we, we had a team that lost very convincingly. <laughs> and um, But it got me, you know, there's some computer vision, some path planning, and starting to think a bit more seriously about artificial intelligence. Um, and at the same time, those last two years at Auckland, I was working part-time during, during term time, but um, in the holidays, I was working full-time um, for uh, one of the statisticians there, a guy called uh, Ross Ihaka. Um, okay. and, and Ross and another person, Robert Gentleman, came up with um, a statistical system called R. The R, uh, the R language, yes, Exactly, which has become very popular, especially during COVID. And yeah. um, so the, the slightly depressing fact about this is probably in terms of impact on numbers of people, the most significant thing I've ever done in my life, I did before I'd even graduated. And um, because I actually, I, I reckon all my contributions to R, right. long gone, eh? I don't think they were very good <laughs> to start with, but I, I really enjoyed um, working for Ross. Um, he was a very good, um, very good supervisor and got me interested in that research world as well. Actually gave me a lot of encouragement um, because he had taught in the United States for quite a long time, I think, I think at Yale and Berkeley. Yeah. And so when he encouraged me to think about further study, uh, it carried a bit of weight. And he's a very kind man, and I, I always um, am grateful for that input from him. And it got me thinking about doing some more work. So, um, yeah, so I came from this, this background where, in many ways, I, once I got here, I had to pinch myself that mm. I'd come to this place because it was so far from where I grew up. Um, <laughs> but, but, you yeah, know, these scary. people had yes. quite an influence along the way. Well, that's a, that's that's a very interesting story. Uh, I and I hear three like top themes that you 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 hear you know from other students uh, uh, at this stage of uh, their lives. Uh, one is obviously uh, what you want to do versus what your parents want you to <laughs> yes. do. So uh, we do have uh, a joint uh, computer science with mathematics oh, degree. There you go. And uh, I've supervised a few of those students, and sometimes they come and say, uh, "Well, I want to do the joint. I'm doing the joint degree, but really, I I wanted to do maths." And mm, my mm -hmm. dad said that you can't get a job with maths, uh, and, and it's not true. No, no. Uh, and then you have people who say, "Oh, um, I'm doing the joint degree because." Uh, maybe I'm not so sure if I'm, I'll be a good engineer, but I know I'm a good mathematician. Mm. In fact, I had a secondary school teacher who said uh, a good mathematician can always become a good programmer, but the opposite is not necessarily not always true. true. Exactly. Yes. So, so you pass yeah. on the advice, and and you see sometimes that you know students actually change uh, from the straight mm. from the joint uh, course onto the the joint program onto the. Uh, uh, you know, single subject computer science program because they just love it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. occasionally somebody says, actually, I'm so good at maths and it would be a shame not to work on that. And mm. it, that's, that's, that's good too. Yes. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're not hogging our students here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's great when you have somebody uh, uh, like a mentor who could mm. uh, right. uh, show you, uh, you know, you must have seen uh, what the research looks like well before yeah. you would have gotten to that level uh, if you know th gone through the uh, rungs of uh, the ladder to you know do a master's and a PhD and so on. Mm. So so that that must have been a, 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 a truly formative experience. I well, guess. it was because we had. The you know, for, for the time I was working for Ross, I was then part of the R core team, not formally, but, mm. um, you know, I had interaction with them. So, you know, these are um, very well-known people and, um, you know, far, far better at this than, you know, I was an undergraduate statistician. It's hard, it wasn't as if I had much to offer right. in, in, in one sense, you know, and so, but because he brought me into that world, that opened up the possibilities of it. Um, and I think really gave me the idea of carrying on into, into postgraduate. Brilliant. into a postgraduate research setting. Brilliant. Yeah. And so when you finished your bachelor's degree, essentially, mm -hmm. yes. uh, you uh, started to look around for what to do next? That's right, yes. And, and particularly, I was looking for um, a way to get over here to the UK. So I had the happy um, good fortune 
that my mum is English and so I had a UK passport. So I knew I could come here from right. New Zealand because normally from New Zealand you could get a two year work visa. Right. And, and so people would, but it's hard to get employment that way. So I thought, well, I'd like to, I knew I wanted to do a, to do a PhD and somebody had given me the very good advice because I thought, well, well, I'll just stay in New Zealand. And they said, well, New Zealand's a very small place. I didn't know that then. Right. You know, so I thought, oh, it's, a, it's the best place in the world. <laughs> and, um, and they said, well, sure, it's, it, you know, but go overseas and come back and then you'll always, you know, benefit from being overseas. So, oh, well, I'll do that. So I thought, well, I'll get a job and then once I'm here, I'll look, um, you know, for a PhD place. And it was the height of the dot-com boom, so it was quite easy to, well, yes. you know, I got interviewed by, um, by Barclays Capital right. out in New Zealand. They sent this team out there and they were desperate for programmers, so they, they were willing to take me and... Um, and a few others of us who came off that, that program there. So that was great because it got me across and straight into work. Um, and, and to be honest, as soon as I arrived in England, I, I'd been here maybe like a couple of weeks working. I thought, man, I love it here. And so I really enjoyed the, the working setting, but I still wanted to do the research qualifications. Right. So after probably about um, three or four months, I started uh, contacting some potential supervisors at different universities around the country and just trying to find um, what I might do. I knew I, I knew I wanted to do artificial intelligence, right. um, mainly because of RoboCup, but yeah. um, then, um, you know, within that I was, I was relatively open to, to what might come about. And, and you ended up with a rather uh, a theoretical uh, topic uh, for, your, really. for yes. your PhD, which is uh, quite a leap from uh, you know, Robocop. making, uh, getting <laughs> robots to, to kick a ball around, which um, I'm not saying to, uh, you know, to play down. It's uh, it's rather the opposite. It's a very complex challenge mm. where you have to do lots of things at once and you focused on, on one theoretical uh, issue, which is, mm. uh, you know, almost, I, 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 I dare say, uh, easier, easier to, to, to focus on mm. one thing and, and yes. dig deep uh, rather yes. than, uh, you know, uh, spread yourself and then try to impress, um, you know, those uh, examiners uh, at the Viva with, uh, with the sufficient depth that would mm. uh, uh, earn you the, the, the PhD. So, uh, mm. uh, how, 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 how did you choose the topic? Was it, uh, do you think uh, it was mostly, uh, you know, the inspiration and the rapport with, uh, with your uh, prospective uh, supervisor? Was it uh, that you found the topic uh, particularly uh, appealing? Well, um, funnily enough, the other PhD that I came close to um, going with was um, working on compilers. So it was, it was very <laughs> different. And I always had a bit of an interest in compilers, but um, probably from having worked on R um, and therefore had that language side of things as well. Um, but the, the PhD that I um, worked on came about because there was a grant application. So uh, Alan Frisch and Toby Walsh had put, um, I'm trying to remember what the, um, there was some research council, I've forgotten the name of it these days. Um, um, EPSERC maybe. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. um, and so that actually, that channeled my interest a bit into the topic because it was, um, partly because it was funded, yes, um, to be course. honest. Um, but also I, I think sometimes, it's very easy to have a general idea, you know, I want to do AI, and, and it gave me something concrete to, to think about. I'm investing some effort in, um, and, and, and it came together nicely as part of a group as well. This, this is another interesting question that springs to mind because, uh, I mean, if you read our uh, student, uh, undergraduate student applications, probably 80% of them will start with the phrase, uh, since the age of five, I've uh -huh. been interested in computers yes. and maybe the second or third sentence will be that I'm fascinated by uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, what it can achieve. And of course, you read, uh, you know, you read uh, in, in, in the press, uh, uh, on the news, uh, what uh, is the latest achievement that has been branded AI. But by the time you start working on an application mm -hmm. or working on you know, discovering what AI is, and probably in your case, uh, you you went straight to the PhD. So um, I'm not sure how many uh, subjects you may have studied that uh, could be branded uh, artificial intelligence uh, related. So, uh, what was the your experience when you started to uh, get into uh, into the field, uh, into the subject matter? Was it, uh, you know, a, a surprise? Was it a disappointment almost that, you know, things are 
so much more technical and uh, mm -hmm. uh, separated so, from yes. the applications? Or was it, aha, I finally have my finger on you know, what actually happens there. So how, how was it for you? I think it was a mix of those different things actually because um, I hadn't done enough, I probably hadn't done enough logic um, okay. before doing it. So doing propositional satisfiability without <laughs> enough of a background in logic. It was just, yeah, happily, you know, at least it was just propositional logic rather than, you know, some sort of predicate thing. I would have been lost. Okay. I never understood prologue, you know. <laughs> um, so there, there were some gaps there, but I'd also, um, I, I guess I'd always had a, um, a real interest and love for the, the mathematical side of things. And so from that point of view, it worked well for me. Um, and I wasn't too worried. I mean, certainly at the time, there was a lot of interest in um, satisfiability as, um, as provers for various applications, but in particular, um, integrated circuit verification. And, um, you know, I, I haven't stayed in touch. I've got no idea if people still use it for that, but um, it, so I could see that there was an outcome for it. But I, you mentioned before the idea of going a bit deeper. And yes. I think that's what had really captured me was mm. um, the opportunity to do that. Um, and the other thing which I didn't know when I started, but which worked well at York, while I, certainly while I was there, um, was the, the research group. Um, and so having, partly because the grant had um, more than one of us as PhD students, and there was a graduate um, uh, RA as well, um, there was a little bit of a sense of working together with other people. Excellent. But in the group as well, um, I really found that um, so you, you found you that had contact with other ideas as well. Yeah, that, yeah. that group spirit, if you yeah. want, uh, to, to be able to exchange ideas and, and communicate, yes. yeah. uh, helpful. Yeah, and the grant also, one of the great things about the grant was that it covered conference attendance as well. Okay. So, and of course there, you know, there's this universe of, of different things um, opens up and the contact with other people. I mean, I don't know, you know, if it's the same for everybody, but I often found the incidental conversations with people at conferences were, of course you've got to have the formal talks, but that that incidental contact around the framework of the conference yeah, was often yeah. the most beneficial thing. It's, and, it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have uh, moved down and forward, I guess, uh, upwards, uh, you know, since uh, uh, you did your PhD and uh, now, for, for a long time by now, uh, our PhD students have a a guaranteed travel fund. So oh, no matter how you end up here, yes. whether you're a self-funded student or whether you're on a, on a project, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, money that has been set aside for you to go to conferences and supervisors actively encourage oh, the students awesome. to engage with that community as soon mm -hmm. as, uh, as you can. And, and sometimes that has even led to further collaborations because, you know, I had a student who went to a conference in her first year, came back uh, from uh, you know, the, the workshop and, and the tutorials after the conference and said, well, I met the researcher who mm. is doing something really interesting and uh, and we ended up collaborating, even co-supervising uh, oh, that student. Okay. So uh, that was that was actually a, a, a really, uh, you know, useful thing yeah. to, to, to happen for, for, for both the student, but also for myself and, of course, uh, you know, for, for the group in the department. Well, during my... Um something with a, at least analogous to that happened and that um, um, the person who actually ended up being my external examiner right. um, and I had a, um, a bit of a connection and then I spent some time over in Portugal in Lisbon um, um, doing some collaborative work there. Um, okay. yeah. Which I'm not sure, to be honest, I'm not sure I added much to their, their group, but the, the contact and the exchange of ideas was um, extremely helpful to me. But so. personal contact is so very important. Yes. Uh, 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 I've been to a summer school where you listened for five days to someone telling you how uh, to write the most efficient uh, parser for natural language. And within a span of 15 seconds, they said, uh, but if you don't uh, use an efficient data structure to access uh, these uh, snippets of uh, parse trees that you're producing, the whole effort goes in vain. And if you just blinked, you would have missed, missed this. One, and it's yes. not in the notes. Uh, yeah. So you think, uh, I'm so lucky to be here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So, uh, so that was uh, that was very interesting. Mm. And yeah, okay. So, so you spent you know three years. I remember that uh, mm. I, I I came across your work. Uh, you know, by the time you had to um, actually uh, go in uh, to to the Viva, so yes. I, I I I got more more in touch with uh, with with, with mm. your work. 
Um, and obviously that was successful. And uh, well, not, I'm very grateful to you because you were, of course, my internal examiner. So <laughs> you, you well, determined its success in a sense. Uh, well, I, mean, <laughs> I, must, I must have seen, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the style of your supervisor who was always, has always been meticulous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we pick things uh, from, from the people we work with. Mm. Uh, so, uh, did you have any contact with your uh, previous employer during your PhD? You mentioned yeah. that you, uh, you were working for Barclays. That's right. So Barclays Capital, which was the investment banking side of Barclays, um, you know, had this massive need for programmers. So, you know, I came all the way from New Zealand to help. Um, to help the British economy and, and financial system, for and which, myself. For which we are grateful. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> and um, So I worked for them in um, initially in commodities and um, some very mundane programming, to be honest. Um, but it got me very interested in markets. And Barclays, for, for all of the impression of investment banking as a, as a very cutthroat industry, which has some truth to it, um, Barclays Capital my experience of that organisational culture was really good. So one of the things they did was when I said that I wanted to go and do the PhD, um, they offered me some part-time work during the PhD. So I think it was every three months I'd go down for two weeks to London, which is not that hard, you know. Mm, and, of course. Um, and realistically, they effectively made some work for me to do. I mean, I, I hope it was useful, but really it was um, a relational connection. They were keeping the connection with me in the hope that when I'd finished the PhD, I'd come back. And, and one of the things that it signalled to me was that, um, you know, again, you talked about that idea of going deeper and um, the, the in-depth aspect of a PhD. I think where they, where they demonstrated some long-sightedness was in being willing to see that that might have value, even though there was no direct outcome. I mean, it, as you say, it was a relatively theoretical topic. There's no straightforward application in investment banking. Um, but they were they were happy to keep that connection going. Um, you know, they're, they're a company; they were self interested. But not everyone has a has a long view like that. And, okay, um, well, that, that's that's interesting to hear. So uh, you've you've already mentioned two. Well, uh, in one case, you you mentioned a person directly mm. uh, who you worked with on on the the R language, mm. and and how that was uh, how that affected your. Uh, and future life choices. Yes. Uh, was there a similar role figure, uh, you know, a mentor figure uh, in uh, at Barclays who uh, kept in touch with you, or was it more like an institutional framework where uh, you kept in touch with the company and uh, over those three years people came and uh, went, but uh, the company itself kept uh, basically in touch and uh, kept that relationship going. So there were there were actually two people there. One was in the IT side of things, so he was my line manager, um, and he was the one who made the, the, the sort of basic um, effort to keep me involved there. Okay. But interestingly, by the time I left Barclays, he had also, as by the time I finished the PhD, he had he had left Barclays. Um, okay. But the other one was on the business side of it. So they, you know, we had the IT division where I was working, um, and the other person was on the that sort of um, business side in commodities, and and he was also then. Um, you know, made made it possible for me to stay, and um, and so again, both of them. I mean, probably compared to somebody like Ross, or compared to my supervisors here, Alan and Toby, not not sort of. You know, it wasn't as if he was super involved in my life, but um, still had enough of um, understanding an understanding of who I was to to you know offer this to me, and it made a massive difference to me. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's always great to hear. It mm. doesn't always happen, probably. No, but uh, it is. It's great when it does. Yeah. So, so yeah. So then uh, you went uh, to London, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you had this job, and uh, is it was it as uh, big a cultural change as one <laughs> might expect to go from, you know, uh, yeah. a, s a small city in the north of England, <laughs> yes, with the largest. Uh, uh, Cathedral uh, north of Rome, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, to to London, where a lot of things were happening. Well, um, so it, it was a big transition. Um, I mean, I because I hadn't quite finished the thesis because right. I reckon, to be honest, I probably had about you know three months of solid work left to do. You know, I could have easily finished it off, but of course, the, the you know, I'd run out of funding, yeah. and so 
I, I was I was greatly helped towards the decision to take the offer up from Barclays because of the um, you know the need to keep buying food and so forth. Absolutely. Um, and um, it, it it was an interesting first year because I was still trying to in the evenings work on the thesis. This is a terrible way to do it, by the way, as as I'm sure you know from doing it part time and you know it, the the juggling of different um, competing yeah, interests is a deeply easy. unpleasant way of living. It, it is easy. So, um, but. The good thing was that it at least kept me somewhat involved in the academic world. I think the downside of it was that it probably didn't, um, you know, it accelerated my step away from the academic environment, um, which in some ways I, I sort of slightly regret um, not having stayed in touch with it. But it just meant that the experience of finishing the PhD wasn't entirely positive because it was just, it was difficult. But I also found that I'd started to get into something in the banking side mm. of things that I really enjoyed. Um, I, I moved from commodities to fixed income, which is bonds and interest rate derivatives, um, still in IT, but working on a real-time system there. Um, and I, I guess there was quite a buzz to it. After having been in something that was pretty theoretical, you know, very much batch, it didn't really matter if anything happened. Looking I, at your face in the reflection of the screen. Exactly. <laughs> yes, you're waiting for things to run, you know, and things <laughs> like this. Whereas we're down to the the real microsecond in terms of yeah. things, um, and and there was a lot at stake as well. Um, High frequency trading. So, not not in the sense that it is now, yeah. but yeah, yeah, okay. that that kind of thing where it really mattered. And we even came up with a little AI trading system. Okay. Unfortunately, um, the the um, the heuristic um, around which it was based was a terrible one, and eventually it blew up. But there were, I just coded it, you know, I didn't um, okay. come yeah, up. Somebody, one of the traders. Somebody else's idea, and a quant uh, came up with it. That's right, yes, and then he lost his job, so, you know, <laughs> it was very sad. But but because the code, you know, this whole thing um, got me really interested in markets, and so um, I ended up doing something completely different from the PhD, um, but we're you know, and we can perhaps try and flesh that out more, but where the PhD did have quite an influence on how, how that went later on. Okay. I mean, this, this is an interesting question because, uh, you know, in the same way in which they recruit lecturers uh, for research achievements and not necessarily with any teaching experience, <laughs> not yes. much sometimes anyway, yes. uh, because you just come out of university. Mm. So, uh, you know, how, you know, how would you get it? Uh, and uh, yet they expect you to be a good lecturer. And of course, mm. uh, you know, York has been very good at uh, you know, training us <laughs> yes. from the very start. Uh, and we have formal programs and whatnot. Uh, but uh, in the same way, I'm assuming that you were recruited on the basis of your you know, very good uh, PhD with you know, a successful piece of research. Uh, and then they wanted probably on top of that someone who was um, good at managing risk, uh, you know, working under pressure, mm. uh, and probably not ready to gamble more and more uh, in the hope that uh, you're going to recover your losses, but uh, you know that you know when to stop, which is which is of course uh, a job. Uh, a PhD supervisor should should do you know we, we but I, I guess <laughs> yes. this is fifty percent of our uh, of our job tell you which way to look when you start and uh, when to stop because uh, if you're good uh, you'll carry on forever uh, which could be good for our publication record but <laughs> probably not as good for you <laughs> for so yeah. so how how would they how would uh, you know uh, your employer uh, in the deal, deal with this situation in this case when they uh, they have they're definitely looking for some skills, uh, but you know they, they haven't necessarily established that, that, that they're there. Uh, do they train you? Also, how do they kind of test you? I know that you started uh, as a programmer, so uh, yeah. obviously you weren't uh, the one making the decisions, but you you ended up as a trader and uh, mm -hmm. uh, vice uh, and then vice director, deputy director. Like Vice president. Vice got president. awesome titles in vice president. investment banking. So you, so. you were vice president. I was actually president. not that senior. So. Uh, well, vice president is, so, sounds is, good is a big thing in my book. Yeah. So, so how did you manage to end up in a situation where you were in charge of a substantial portfolio hmm. and uh, a substantial amount of money at risk? Hmm. Uh, hmm. You know, how did you went from how did you go from uh, you know a, a, a PhD? 
um, you know, students and, and somebody mm. with with a, a fresh degree to to that position. Mm. So, I mean, as is often the case in life, to some degree there was a there was a bit of good fortune involved um, in that my um, actually not my line manager, but above him, had moved to a different bank, um, and you know things had gone well with the programming, um, and so he he wanted me to come across to the other firm, and um, I got an offer there, and the business manager. Um, I guess you know perhaps I'd, um, he'd become aware of my involvement a bit and um, so he said well why don't you come across we're looking for somebody with a technical background you know quantitative background to come onto the trading desk um, initially in an assistant role but you know he, he noticed that I was interested in markets and trading and so forth and said well this would be a good way to test it out um, and, and really made me a great offer to stay in the firm um, and so I, I went across and became um, junior to um, again somebody who was a, a very good mentor certainly uh, put quite a bit of pressure on me at various points but um, and was also very capable at bringing me into that into that environment and of course what I did initially was mostly programming tasks for them and, and so forth on the trading desk right. but it got me into the, the practice of, um, of trading as part of the, um, the setup there and um, I mean you mentioned the thing about not not gambling more and more I think one of the critical things um, in that is actually just just having the ability to be honest so where people get into trouble is when they hide losses right. the fundamental thing you have to do is when you've made a mistake um, you actually just you tell somebody about it now at that point there's an opportunity to correct it um, it, it almost never gets better by hiding things and especially because you need honesty and trust you know same as in academia you've got to be scrupulous um, it, you know all relationships break down people do dumb things once they start getting dishonest and um, and so that, that's fundamentally where things break down I think and I, w I had again the good fortune to be amongst the, in the particular group I was working with um, some fantastic people who are really good at this you know they're very very honest and open people um, and, and very able to encourage that um, and develop that in me and, and in terms of what I did um, the quantitative side of things um, turned out to be useful really during the or in the lead up to the financial crisis um, and and again it was an organizational culture thing that my uh, my manager but I think more broadly in the company encouraged a degree of um, intellectual curiosity which is always I guess part of academia but it's not always perceived as being part of the corporate world in fact many of my friends have worked in corporate roles where that's that's not part of the, the culture. Um, but it was a good thing because it, it meant that I, being a geek, mm. I got interested in some aspects of risk that were um, largely irrelevant um, and then became quite relevant during the financial crisis. And um, so some of the things that we did, I mean, really it was, you know, my, um, my manager um, was brilliant at all of this stuff as well. So, um, you know, I had somebody um, pointing me in the right, like you say, you know, work on this, um, stop working on that. Th those kinds of things continue to be um, essential, but I guess I found a little bit of a niche around some of that side of things and um, and really enjoyed developing that, as well as the, the market side of things. Excellent. I mean, it's uh, it's always great when we can find uh, satisfaction in what we do, yes. and when it's not only measured in the amount of money we've made uh, exactly. to our employer, I guess that's... Yep. Uh, yeah, even better. Although, of course, uh, you know, people wouldn't say no when you offer them a well-paid job. <laughs> I, I didn't say no. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, it, there, there are corrosive aspects to, to in being in a very high-paid environment. There are corrosive aspects to most um, organizational settings, right? You know, there are different pathologies for different kinds yeah. of organizations. And, um, and, and certainly having access to a, um, you know, I think it's true to say a disproportionate amount of wealth, which happens in banking um, has its negative sides but um, there were there were some happy outcomes as well and I think it's I mean from my point of view it's it's always fascinating to think that you can't predict um, you know with a research qualification um, it does open other options up we, we used to take on physics PhDs particularly for the quantitative so and, and maths PhDs as well of course yes. but you know I think physics gave that slightly more applied edge um, sometimes and yes um, you know again this I think that you know people found real fulfillment in that work um, 
um, as well as a, I'd imagine the, the fact that they could own a house in London was, was a nice, <laughs> um, well, a literal bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this, this is actually was going to be my next question because, uh, uh, you know, your path was obviously from from science and engineering mm. uh, to uh, you know to the, this, the, the world of uh, you know business mm. and uh, finance and and, and trades, uh, and you know it doesn't seem unreasonable to think well surely there are people who have degrees in finance. Uh, what about them? Uh, how did mm. they uh, did, did, did did the bank recruit this kind of people? W yeah. Were they in needs of some of the skills that? You had uh, as a, a computer science graduate and, and PhD. Uh, so, uh, what about you know? W w was it? Would you say? Uh, is, would, is it possible to say that it's easy? It was easier for for you coming with the technical skills to develop the uh, the, the knowledge of the you know this financial world, or would you say it was the other way around that someone who would, with this financial background could pick up, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bits of maths or statistics or, or, or programming that were needed? Mm. Or is it really like a, 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 a synergy of, uh, and you need a team of people with uh, the uh, specialized skills? Mm. I, I think the latter, you know, I think it was that mix of people was particularly productive. Um, so, you know, since I've left finance, people often ask me what I miss most from it. And the thing I miss the most and always, the thing that I loved most about that job was the sense of really close teamwork. Um, so we had a variety of um, competencies that we brought to it and we worked extremely closely together. Um, and, and I've not experienced that since. Now, there were all the usual you know, points of disagreement and so forth. Yes. And there's no doubt that if I'd done a formal finance qualification, that would have been very beneficial too. And even within the, the quantitative aspects of it, um, like there's bits of maths that really make sense to me in sort of in a very intuitive way and there's other aspects of maths that do not <laughs> and um one of the parts of maths that you know does not i've never quite got it even though i love it um is is aspects of calculus um you know things like partial derivatives and so forth right. i can at one level appreciate it but i've never been very good at them and that's a big part of financial uh, mathematics is um is that 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 aspect of um the other things like stochastic calculus and so forth are part of it, and I, I, again, I can in, I can think intuitively about that a bit better. Right. Um, so even within the the quantitative side of things, you know, again, we needed people. So I mean, two the two people I worked most closely with both had graduate finance qualifications. Um, my line manager and um, one of the other team members, and they were, you know, they were completely different league from me at certain aspects of it, and. Um, um, yeah, so there was there was this mix of things, and I, like I said, I ended up in a bit of a. I was so fortunate. I ended up in a niche that suited me, mm. and I could easily have ended up in a group of people where um, what I brought to it wasn't actually that useful, um, because there were other aspects of of trading um, that I just wasn't as good at as as some of the other people. I mean, it's a very. Um, I'm just trying to think what the right word is here. Um, every day how much you've made or lost is reported and very visible. Yes. And so it's a very direct feedback loop. And, and I will, you know, I didn't, it wasn't as if I did terribly, but I could also see the difference between me and some of the people who are better. Um, and, and, you know, there's the, um, that, again, that mix of different people was so critical um, and probably a bit different from what I'd experienced in the academic environment where, of course, your, your groups are typically, and very sensibly, a little bit closer in terms of the skill mix. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm just thinking. Uh, I <coughs> th there's there's always people who are better than you at what mm. you do, and uh, <laughs> yes. I, I think part of uh, you know uh, being mature and professional is to to accept it and admire it. <laughs> yes, yes, rather uh, feel um, and with insecure. Or yeah, with, yeah, with some of the uh, with some of the uh, uh, social platforms that emerge uh, in academia uh, you get like reports on a weekly basis uh, how many people have read your article how many people mm -hmm. have cited your articles and sometimes you come across uh, colleagues uh, who have been cited 
as many times as your papers have been read in that week and you feel humbled. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, you think oh. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, of my department <laughs> and that I have the chance to work with these people. So uh, yeah. yeah, it must be that kind of feeling as well. I mean, it's very similar. And I, yeah. I think, as you say, there's, there are most environments, you either there's, there's some pressure to develop in that sense. And um, I think, um, you know, the, that particular corporate setting was one where, um, a bit like citation ranking and so forth, you know, there was a very, very quantitative measure of, and, and the, of course the trick was not to measure your worth, um, mm. your value as a human being in that way. Um, but of course all of us are part of being human is the fact that we, yeah. we do precisely that. Um, Everybody likes so. success. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So. And of course it, it's enjoyable, um, you know, that, that sense of fulfillment partly comes from doing something where you're demonstrably good at it. And, yes. um, and so th there's a great deal of satisfaction in seeing that. Um, so Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what is very hard, uh, for instance, in a PhD, because yes. for three yep. years you sit in a room uh, yeah. in front of a screen uh, and uh, sometimes it's hard to know how good you are yeah. uh, unless yep. your supervisor tells you that. And, uh, you know, we're trying to do a good job of this, but yeah. uh, sometimes it's hard and sometimes you want to hear it from somebody else, which is mm. why we push our students to submit papers to publish. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to publish papers uh, to have the PhD, but you must have felt uh, yourself, uh, you know, how difficult it is if you didn't have any other feedback apart from, you know, what you hear from your supervisor. Yeah. So, and that's a skill that uh, I guess uh, probably as you see the need for it uh, uh, wh wh while you're a PhD student, mm. hopefully you develop some of it, uh, you know, to, to be able to give back uh, if you're people, in the exactly. position uh, yeah. to, to guide somebody else. Yeah. Well, and I, I really want to acknowledge that both um, um, Alan and Toby, who were my supervisors at the start, um, Toby, did Walsh. Toby Walsh, Alan yes, Frisch. and Alan Frisch, yeah, yeah. Um, did that. Because um, Toby Walsh moved across to Cork yeah, halfway through that. my PhD, yeah, I remember that. and one of the things I deeply appreciated was that he um, um, offered me the chance to go and spend some time over there. You know, continue to input into me, mm. even though I was formally no longer um, his student. Um, and I think things like that may make a big difference because um, it's not just about a job. Again, it's a I guess it's being human, but you mm. know sometimes people people don't always demonstrate that humanity. And so yeah. that's um, as you say, it's helped me then to think about as I. Not that I have formal academic supervision, but um, in, in terms of supervision of others and mentoring them, that you know, I hope that I've tried to, to do some of the same things. Yeah, and, I haven't seen yeah. Toby in probably almost 20 years, but I, mm. I still have uh, very vivid memories of him. So uh, well, uh, I'm still friends with him on Facebook. Oh, well, so, he's in Australia, you see, so yeah, he no, sometimes no. posts in the same uh, time zone as me. No. Um, and he's become. Uh, he's, you know, obviously had a real interest in the ethics of AI, which has now I've become... I've seen some of his uh, papers, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, this, this is interesting. I mean, uh, we're good at uh, research, but uh, we spend our time looking for friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, you know, we are variously good at. Um, hmm. And uh, in, in, in this, uh, you know, in your job with Barclays, this is something that you found. Hmm. Uh, how, what was your experience when you were at York? Did you did you meet, uh, you know, did you make some friendships? Did you meet uh, other people that uh, you know you 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 stayed in touch with uh, mm. that mm. Um, somehow affected your life, if you want? Mm. No, I did um, partly through the computer science department. So um, two of my close friends, Stephen Watkinson and um, Chris Colgar, who was actually working for the IT. IT services by the time I arrived in York. Right. Um, I've, I've stayed in, in touch with, so Stephen, well, I was best man at Stephen's wedding. Okay. Um, Stephen was best man for me. Um, more broadly in the university, I met my wife, which is a you know reasonably significant friendship. Yeah. Um, and um, <laughs> so, um, and, and actually built a network of friends. I, I haven't stayed in close touch with them all, um, but you know, that sort of loose, um, that loose contact with, um, with them has persisted for a really long time. No. Um, so you've so met it's been a very beneficial, it was a wonderful three years to be honest. You, you've you've yeah. met a few very special people <laughs> yeah. by the sound of it. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And so, it was great, you know, because yeah. it's, it's a nice location here. So, you know, I lived yes. very, it, obviously it was much smaller. Yeah. It's a long time ago now. Well, um, we've grown organically. You've seen the new campus oh, now. That's amazing. Yeah. It, it is, it is uh, quite impressive. Mm. Um, 
Yes, uh, initially I thought you know, I could walk everywhere, <laughs> 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 but uh, I'm very happy I have a bicycle. So yeah, and uh, so you know, out of this, uh, you know, my uh, the the ideological side of my upbringing, I'm, I'm Bulgarian, so. Uh, I was told when I was a kid that you know things are going to only get better and better, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems that it went uh, that way for you for a while, and you get the, you got this fantastic job, and uh, you, know, you met your wife, mm -hmm. and you made friends, uh, uh, and you know you had a degree to to show uh, for mm -hmm. uh, those three years of work, so. How come you're still not at Barclays? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, another thread in my life has been um, involvement in the church, and and. That was actually um, a, a constant here while I was at York as well. Okay. Um, but when we moved, um, when I moved back down to London and then um, um, I got married after a year down there, uh, my wife joined me down there and um, we, we um, chose to live in quite a poor part of um, London and be, be involved in a church um, community there. Um, okay. There's a real contrast, you know, I'd go off to Canary Wharf yeah. during the day <laughs> and then come back to Bethnal Green and, and um, it was it was very um, uh, very sort of stark contrast a lot of the time, but I loved that, um, and partly I guess because during the financial crisis I became quite um, quite exhausted I think, um, and it must have been a very very challenging time. Yeah, I mean I, I certainly don't want to um, overplay that in the sense that you know I, I I was very fortunate through it to be part of the. Um, system in a way that meant that I was insulated from a lot of the harm that other people suffered. Mm. Um, but at, at the same time, it was, um, it just left me feeling a bit tired of what I'd been doing. Um, and I'd always had this, this thought about going into, um, into the church, into uh, Christian ministry at some stage, and had got involved in things a lot um, informally while I was here at York as well. Right. So it was another real strand of my time here. Um, and so when I reached that point, um, it, this was about um, oh, in 2010 at Barclays. Um, I said, look, actually, I'd like to go and retrain in theology. So I went all the way back to doing an undergraduate degree. Um, Barclays, again, were actually really wonderful. They kept me on, again, they, with some part-time stuff and some summer work, consulting work. More meaningful this time, I think, and, right. and hopefully, you know, um, perhaps I'd have hopefully had a bit more to offer at that stage. And... Um, and so it's it's kept me involved in not not in science, but at least in in something quantitative. While I've then um, been involved much more in the church side of things, and um, we eventually moved back to New Zealand. Um, so I'm I'm part Maori, um, and there's an indigenous um, church, Maori Anglican church, back in New Zealand, which I'm I'm now part of. Um, funnily enough, it's actually you know these little threads in life. It's brought me back into contact with people who are now are very interested in um, in data sovereignty. So for indigenous peoples, some of the efforts around, um, you know, within within the cultural setting has been around preservation of indigenous languages and customs and so forth. Right. Now, of course, if you're Apple, you would eventually like, or, or Google or whoever, you know, you want your products to be available in as many languages as possible. Sure. Um, and this, this often brings a little bit of, um, uh, discontent amongst indigenous peoples. What happened, who owns the data then? Who owns the data, sorry, accent issues. Mm. Um, who owns the data um, that's produced from learning this language, which is you know, a, a treasure that's almost been lost and so forth. So um, interestingly enough, you still can't get um, on your phone um, the Maori language spoken well by um, any of the big companies because nobody will participate in this effort to um, you know, create the, the, the data sets that would allow them to learn sufficiently from it. Right. Um, but somebody's done it um, as an internal project. So um, there's a group up north, um, there's a guy called Peter Lucas Jones, who, who put some effort into creating the infrastructure to do a lot of the ML work around around the Maori language to, to try and capture right. some of that. Um, there's, um, there's a little group of them, um, uh, a, a professor at, at Waikato University, she's called Tahu Kukutai, um, and so she's done a little bit of, um, the, she's a sociologist by, by profession, uh, but again has worked on this kind of the ethics of AI as it relates to particularly machine learning, ownership of outcomes and so forth. Now, 
in, in a sense, the main outcome of this has, mean, has been a practical obstacle in one way because it means I can't actually engage with Te Reo Māori on the main platforms that I use. But they've recently brought out an app that helps you to learn the pronunciation, which is one of the more difficult things about that language. Okay. So, you know, what's common in a lot of other languages, so your phone can listen to you and then tell you, did you pronounce it correctly? Yes or no, and so it's forth. It's very interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's also my personal interest because mm. I, uh, you know, from, from the time of my uh, master's uh, thesis yeah. and my PhD, I've been uh, interested in natural language processing yep. and in computational linguistics. Uh, and, and things have changed a lot, haven't they? Because, mm. uh, you know, if you go all the way back to the 60s and 70s, you know, people were collecting data, yes. annotating that data, analyzing it. And uh, um, I'm Bulgarian, but I did my uh, both my degrees actually in uh, uh, in Prague. But uh, I, what started as the as Czechoslovakia and ended up uh, being the Czech Republic. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and there was uh, in Prague there was this uh, literally. I mean, there was this massive building, uh, seven, yeah. six, seven stories. That was called uh, the the Czech uh, inst the Institute of the Czech National Corpus, like oh, text yeah, yeah. corpus. Yes, yes. So, so that, was, that was like a corpus of text that was analyzed, annotated, mm. yeah. uh, and it was, of course, very valuable because mm. that was the only way to do things at the time. Uh, and if you were just a mere student and you went there and said, can I play with your corpus? They said, ha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how do you imagine that will to, yeah. to, to happen? Uh, and of course, now, you know, the data is online and so on. But there was also another shift, and I remember uh, putting this on a slide uh, at some point uh, through my PhD, uh, talking about, you know, the the, the, the cultural dominance of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. languages which where, you know, you have um, a country or a, a, an institution, a company that can afford to develop the resources. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you almost, uh, you know, you're ready to talk about cultural imperialism because yeah. because you cannot uh, use uh, uh, minority languages mm. if you don't have that data. And with the advancement of artificial intelligence and that shift towards unsupervised learning, yeah. where just raw yeah. data is enough to do a lot of the things that, mm. are, in fact, uh, it's more, uh, the, the approach is maybe even more robust uh, uh, to do what you, you, you're trying to achieve. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, these things became yes. uh, easier they they, they, they became uh, uh, possible that's right uh, yeah. and uh, so in a sense uh, artificial intelligence have has had this almost uh, you know uh, liberating uh, influence no. yeah. uh, or the I potential mean, to be potential yes, yes. Uh, yeah. because of course uh, it is flattering to me that uh, uh, you know uh, I can uh, speak uh, Bulgarian to my phone mm. uh, if I can uh, mm. Uh, mm. It, it, yes. it's, it, it's, it's, it's a great right? thing. Or yeah. you can search in your own language and all of a sudden mm. uh, you, you don't have to uh, mix even uh, in, your, uh, in your own language uh, mm. uh, words from, from, from another language because you, you, you keep using it because there's, there's no other way you can access information. Yeah. So, so that's... Uh, uh, it's an interesting thing because it's, uh, uh, you, you, you've been talking now about uh, the ethical aspects of... Yeah. Uh, um, what your PhD was uh, about, this general area mm. of artificial intelligence. Uh, so, um, and obviously, uh, being a, uh, uh, a, a minister mm. uh, yeah. of the church uh, uh, makes you... Uh, uh, well, I hopefully guess it sensitizes me to these issues. A, a role, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a role model, but uh, it's an, you're an authority uh, you know, in your community, at least, uh, mm. when, when you discuss these things. Uh, so, how do you see these things? Uh, you know, the, the, how do you see your background in the scientific method, mm. Uh, mm. which I'm sure you, 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 you're very comfortable with? I remember seeing uh, uh, comments uh, online uh, about uh, your, your comments about uh, the, the need for people to get vaccinated, for instance, oh, yes, yes. Uh, which I was uh, very happy to see uh, because I genuinely think that, uh, uh, you know, every single person uh, who could help uh, yeah. in society uh, should should do something about it, uh, let alone people who are in the position uh, of authority or uh, and being respected yeah. and listened to. So that mm -hmm. was that was a great thing to do. But uh, okay, may maybe say okay, these are these were extreme circumstances. Uh, I have you know we we are familiar with uh, uh, one up, uh, way of you know uh, bringing together. Uh, uh, religion and science, which yeah, is yes. uh, 
keep the separate magisteria apart, <laughs> uh, and you know, which has certain virtues to it. They, they yeah. don't interfere, yeah. uh, and that's probably a good thing if uh, you're having a drink in the pub with friends. <laughs> but okay, in, in your life as a person uh, who is trying to do the right thing, mm. uh, what uh, I mean, I, I for instance uh, saw with interest, but not necessarily a surprise, that you were very uh, uh, interested in, uh, in this, uh, I can't remember, there was like a, the, the Parliament, uh, uh, Westminster Parliament had a, a committee w uh, looking into the ethical aspects of AI. Yes, that's and, right. And, and you, you, you sent them an opinion uh, piece, mm. right? Yes, I did. So, um, why did you become interested in it? Uh, and, and, and what do you think? Mm you thought uh, was an important point to make? I mean, partly it's a, it's a matter of circumstance. So, you know, training, retraining in a new field takes time and certainly becoming embedded in the practice of it takes time. So it's taken me, um, oh, and I'm still doing, you know, I'm back here because I'm doing, um, the memory of the first PhD faded enough that I could embark <laughs> on a second one. So, you know, I'm hopefully finishing my thesis in theology soon. But um, one of the, one of the features of Maori culture and society is um, that, that that kind of division of different magisteria is um, impossible to hold on to um, in, I think in many indigenous cultures actually, but um, particularly, certainly the one I know is is, is Maori culture. And so there's um, um, the, the place of the church, while it's complex because of the colonial history, um, is still one where um, where I have to some degree a voice. And so I, was, I guess I felt, for example, around vaccination, not that I have any expertise in vaccination, but it, I was certainly able, I hope, to bridge the gap to some of my friends who, um, who were um, in that space. And hopefully as well to build a little bit of trust in the Maori community um, in the possibility that science might have something um, which could add value. So one of the things I like about that is that most of us um, as human beings, I think, Trying to live divided lives is a complex business, um, and it is much easier if you can find some way to integrate it. And Absolutely. so, to me, um, this has been one way to do that. Where my interest in the ethics of AI has um, started to resurface is because an enormous amount of my Christian ministry involves um, dealing with situations where systemic injustice um, has um, ha has played out in particular ways for Maori, and and I guess it's also made me aware of that for other minority groups. Now, I'm, I'm part Māori, I'm, I'm not exactly dark, so it's hardly as if I've faced a great deal of prejudice in my life, personally. But being involved in those communities now means that I can see the ways that that plays out. So one is, of course, the, the way in which vaccination, you know, distrust, different, I mean, Māori have about 10 years left, less life expectancy than than European New, New Zealanders. Now, that's a, that's a massive difference, right? So do a lot of people in the north of England. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Averages are one thing, aren't mm. they? But the stratification yeah. of it um, is another. And and I think the same is potentially true around the, the applications of AI, especially when, um, you know, some of the machine learning aspects of things, not that, again, as you know, that's not my expertise, but at least I'm vaguely aware of, of the potential for, for issues there. I'll give you a practical example. Google Translate um, does, can't, you know, has got, um, the Maori language in there is one of its options. Okay. But there's no corpus of the kind that you're talking about. Um, and in fact, one of the rather odd features of um, the corpus of texts that is available for Google to learn from, I mean, the, the, the script is, you know, Latin script, so it's straightforward to, okay. to OCR it. Um, the, pro probably one of the largest um, bits of material is, um, is religious texts. So right. Christian texts. So what it means yes, is that you end up with these very strange translations um, that I can recognize. As a, as a Christian minister, you know, I, I, I know where these little fragments of, right. of, of either English or Maori come from, really. Okay. So it purports to translate idiomatically, but mm. of course it's not, it's not remotely. And, and you also end up with these jarring contrasts of, um, of, of language register. Um, right. Now, it, to me, that's mostly just amusing. I find it funny, but it, it tells you something about the the underlying um, challenge that's involved um, when something like this is, you know, a, a model that's been developed in another setting is thrown at it. And I think 
you know, there's, there's interest a lot more widely than, than New Zealand. The Maori language comes from a group of languages that comes from, we were talking about Indonesia before. Yes, yes. And actually, you know, you can hear Indonesian numbers and Maori numbers are um, still yeah, quite recognisably right. similar. So from the Malay kind of family of languages. Yeah, and if you go back far enough, actually up to Taiwan. Um, so it's one of these things where different areas of science, DNA tracking and mm. um, linguistic tracking Which brings it back to the same language. project I've been group. working on with some linguists for the last five, really? six years. Oh, yes. So we, we, yeah. we, we, we compare the correlation between genetic distances, geographic yes. distances and syntactic distances. Oh, there we go. We just had a paper accepted. Well, and it's, <laughs> it's, a good, it's an interesting language group because of course it's got no correlation mm. with um, Indo-European languages. The, yeah. the, grammatically it's very, very different. So, mm. um, I mean, interestingly, Google Translate is, is extremely good grammatically because the early missionaries were scrupulous about their grammar. So these, these texts that it's trained on right. are grammatically precise in a way that a lot of modern speakers, you know, so sometimes a little bit. It's not like learning from Twitter. No, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, but, but it's a very formal register of language in, in yeah. one sense. But yeah. So essentially a company is doing what they can do with the data available. Yes, uh, and but with no engagement with the local yeah, people. Okay, exactly. Yeah, okay, exactly. So uh, you want to see, you know, what can be done about this. Exactly, yep. And, and of course, there's all the other well-known issues around um, machine learning and um, the ethical, you know, particularly in the US, mm. you know, where you can teach your, um, you know, one of the best ways of discriminating between criminals and non-criminals is, is on the basis of, um, of racial uh, features and photographs. And so what you're really training your system to do is to be racist um, and, and embedding, you know, I, I, I realize these are very naive approaches, but it's still... You, know. you, uh, you you will probably I don't know if you, you if you if you knew but uh, uh, you know there w there was a piece of European reg legislation that uh, uh, basically uh, forbade the use of uh, uh, your uh, gender uh, in the decision uh, when your uh, insurance premium is calculated for for your car ah, so yes. uh, which meant uh, if I understand uh, correctly that. Uh, you know, a, a lot of women uh, had to pay more. more. Yes. Uh, but uh, they said uh, this this is illegal, uh, and yep. uh, so this is something that uh, uh, we will be seeing probably more yep. uh, and more. And uh, uh, of course, the the, 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 the we, we, we I, I've just had an inquiry from a student who said I want to do a PhD on. Uh, the you know the, how we fight bias in yeah, in yeah. Uh, um, machine learning systems and I was like okay well that's, yeah. that's nice I'm, I'm, I, I have something ready for you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah. that that was great yeah. um, so uh, this this almost brings us back to you know to you know how we bring together uh, well ethics I guess mm. uh, and um, and science um, yeah and yep. uh, it's, it's it's interesting to see that uh, you know obviously with hindsight you can see where things could have been done better. Yep. But when you are doing uh, these things, uh, you do what is the standard of the time, and then yep. uh, you you look back and you say, mm, okay, maybe I could have done this better. And then there is the dilemma of uh, do I uh, renounce on my. <laughs> That's the right. work I've done, uh, or, right. or the person I was, or how, but of course we need to change mm. and move on. So, so now you you are close to submission, understand? Yes. Uh, and and do you want to tell us the the topic of your thesis? Again, it, it, I mean, it, as we'll all appreciate, the, you know, you end up narrowing in. So I had a grand plan. Um, Having had the finance side of things, I wanted to, um, and, and having you know been deeply involved in the financial world during, you know, in the lead up to and during the financial crisis, um, I wanted to have a look at, at the scriptural texts to see um, what I could discern there around um, the ethics of um, financial activity, economic activity. Really, I'm talking here about systemic things, though, because. Um, mm. You know, if I can be blunt, the, the, the Christian faith is, is fairly, um, uh, people don't always do it, but it's fairly clear cut on what you should do with wealth um, at a personal level. Namely, you should make sure that it goes to people who need it more. Um, right. Now, as I say, this is a <laughs> part of the Christian faith that is frequently, um, you know, people try and suppress it and, 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 and um, you know, 
it's a very unpleasant thing to hear, <laughs> um, especially if, like me, you became wealthy. <laughs> and um, so um, I, I, I didn't really feel like there was, there was too much um, in terms of um, trying to understand that. But I, I guess I'd, I'd realised by being involved in a system that the system really matters, like the institutional form of finance, um, some of the ways in which um, the technicalities in any discipline, we find the technicalities, going deep into it, matters a great deal. And you can't simply talk at a high level um, about it, as I have just been about machine learning, you know, so yeah. oh, forgive me for that. But, and so I guess I just wanted to see, is there something there? Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that in due course, I'll have one or two things to say. Um, I have also, I guess, my my sense is that in, in much of the West, um, even though Christian faith has been deeply important to me personally, um, I've, I've noticed that um, where once the church was deeply involved in science, so on and so forth, um, that very often now Christian ministers have been um, speaking from a perspective of, well, to be honest, you know, ignorance of the, the disciplines in which they, um, in which to speak. Of course, this, this is, um, um, meant that, you know, Christian life is often seen as deeply irrelevant. Now, because it matters a great deal to me, um, and, and because of my ethnic heritage as well, where um, the church for all of its complexity is deeply valued, um, I do have, um, I guess, the desire to, if I can, show ways in which um, Christian ethics um, is relevant still um, to a Western world that, that has been deeply formed, even if it's shifted from allegiance to Christian faith, that that's still been deeply formed by the ideas that come there. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that there are ways in which there's a, it's possible to contribute to um, a better society by understanding where our concepts of um, virtue have come from. That means that then even amongst people who don't share my allegiance to the Christian faith can appreciate um, that there might be a way of thinking about our, our shared values that can be constructive. Um, around the finance of ethics, uh, the ethics of finance and financial systems. So this is my big dream, and as my yeah. supervisor reminded me recently, yeah. currently I'm writing for an audience of two people, right. you know, <laughs> my internal and my external, and, and she, she quite rightly said, Lyndon, make sure you're not preaching. So I, I very briefly preached to you, which I no. hope you'll forgive. No, that's, with, uh, that's, um, uh, that's I, what I'd like to do. I have, I have so. been uh, in a situation when a PhD student came to me and he said, well, I want to work on this, um, software system, uh, financial forecasting, and so on. And, mm. and, you know, you have a personal conversation as well, and you say, mm, okay, yeah. so you're from uh, uh, a Muslim country, so mm. how do banks you work in your country? Yeah. And then he comes next time and he says, that was a great idea. I said, w w what idea are you talking about? Oh, you, you said that I should do a PhD in uh, Islamic finance. I said, I don't think you said <laughs> such thing, but any such thing, but that is an interesting idea. And, yeah. and we started talking, and then we ended up with a uh, basically, the, you know, if you assume that your, your basic principle uh, is totally different, that essentially interest is not uh, allowed, yeah, that's right. uh, then uh, you have a completely different mechanism. Uh, and uh, for that mechanism to function, uh, you may have to develop some software solutions. Mm -hmm. And he ended up producing a PhD <laughs> three years down the four years Here down the go. line. Uh, and uh, somehow I ended up being a supervisor of a PhD in Islamic finance. <laughs> uh, and but, but of course, then he says, uh, well, by the way, uh, you know, uh, a thousand years ago, uh, you know, uh, in, the, the Christians didn't charge interest rate. That's right. And yeah. I said, yeah, that's that's. So that's I during the Reformation. <laughs> well, a little bit before then, but yeah, yeah. And that, that's exactly the kind of question I'm interested in: is those mm. systemic ones of what ought we to do as a society? And, and of course, these days for me, it's um, particularly tied in with how does this affect the ways in which society is stratified. Um, so I think a sensitivity to that um, is something that's come from from the work that I yeah. do in the church now. My, um, my so. grandfather was a teacher. Oh. He was part of a mutual uh, we where he went yeah. and said, I'll put uh, here a hundred uh, bucks. Uh, so I can borrow 400 and I'll oh. pay you back. And they, were, they weren't charging, it, charging interest. Yeah. They were just uh, helping each other. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and then I had colleagues from other countries that said, but you're not Muslim. Why are you interested in Islamic finance? He said, imagine, uh, you know, somebody comes uh, and you're a physicist and they say, 
Well, actually, velocities don't add up because there is a maximum velocity, <laughs> and now you have a different rule mm. to start with. You know, work out the, the rest of the system. That's a challenge. That's a that's mm. an intellectual challenge. Exactly. Uh, and and they accepted it. That, I mean, because. I guess they, they, everybody who works with finance thinks oh somebody else is the, the other ones are there for the money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you know th there is there is a challenge and and so essentially if I have to sum up what you just said if if that's correct, uh, you you you're not seeing uh, your your Christian faith and uh, you know what you do as uh, you know filling the gaps that uh, science has left out, but uh, you're trying to bring uh, uh, an ethical system. To uh, you know, to what is the cutting edge of science nowadays, uh, mm. in order to you know to make our lives better, fairer, I yeah, guess. I hope so. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. a fantastic thing to know, uh, and hopefully we may claim a little bit of uh, you know a contribution that uh, uh, you know gave uh, birth to that ambition. More than a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, in person. No, I mean, the years here were deeply formative for me. Um, you know, the formal educational side of it um, and the research culture, but um, just the life here as well. Mm. And I think, um, and I also want to acknowledge you in, the, in that you've kept in touch for all of those years. Um, yeah, well, we met up in Oxford a little while ago it's and been a, pleasure. a few years ago. And um, that, that's been, you know, again, I've, I've mentioned some of the others who have had that influence. And I think, um, you know, I'm really grateful to you for that. So the $64,000 yeah. question, uh, I mean, I hope uh, you don't mind me mentioning that uh, you have three uh, brilliant boys. Yeah. Would you be happy to see one of them come to York one day? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, that'd be yeah, great. We'll that'd if, be brilliant. It <laughs> De it's depressingly close these days. You know, I think, oh, ch my children go to university, but my oldest is 14, so it's actually not that far away. And um, I, yeah. I, I must say, there was a, a brief moment in time when I was a supervisor of two people, a dad and his son. <laughs> one of them was an undergraduate student, the other one was a PhD oh, wow. student. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that, that was something special, I guess. <laughs> well, the <laughs> funny thing about being still involved in formal education is that the, um, the, the even the graduate students are closer in age to my children now than they right. are to me. So I feel very, uh, very mm. ancient. Um, but from what I hear, that only gets worse. So uh, I'm sure you have plenty of time to uh, achieve your ambitions. So uh, let me wish you best of luck. Thank you. And thanks thanks um, for this as well. Thank you very yeah. much for, for coming all the way from Oxford to to York, I know uh, your time is very precious right now. And if anybody had asked me to do anything else but uh, finish my PhD uh, a few weeks before submission, I would have said no. <laughs> so thank well, you for your generosity. Just to hope that my uh, my supervisor <laughs> doesn't see this. No, so. we'll, we'll, we'll we'll keep this <laughs> no, uh, you know, under the uh, under the radar. Right? Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Lyndon. Thank you very Cheers. much. Yeah. Thanks a lot.